You're listening to Veg Your Best. There has never been a more important time to be vegan. So at Veg Your Best, I'm here to help you limit and eliminate the consumption of animal products without feeling deprived or overwhelmed or unsupported, even if no one you know is vegan. My name's Michelle Olander, and if I could go vegan in 2015, in my 50s, with all my excuses, I know you can start moving in that direction, too. Veg your best, and there's nothing you can't do. Episode 133, The Vegan Museum of Chicago, with founder Kay Stepkin. Welcome, welcome, my veg heads, and welcome back, my veg your besties. Welcome to Veg Your Best. We have an interview this week with Kay Stepkin, and Kay is the founder of the Vegan Museum. Did you even know there was a vegan museum? The Vegan Museum is in Chicago, and in our interview today, we're going to hear how, this is a new one, this is a new vegan journey story, how a James Bond novel started Kay on her road to vegetarianism, and how that evolved into her work as a vegetarian entrepreneur in Chicago for many, many years, and after working in the vegetarian community of that famously meat-centered city, Kay started to wonder about who had come before her. Well, that's how all historians are born. I think wondering, wondering about what happened just before. So Kay Stepkin took time from her busy roster of events at the museum to talk with me about her vegan journey, her idea to create a museum project, and how it has created opportunities for learning and conversation and sharing in a variety of Chicago area neighborhoods. I think you'll enjoy hearing from Kay Stepkin and hearing just one other way vegans are showing up and spreading the word about compassion and awareness. And I'll check back with you on the other side. Kay Stepkin, welcome to Veg Your Best. Thanks, Michelle. Glad to be here. I'm really glad you're here. You know, I first heard about you, Kay, and um, the Vegan Museum that you're the founder of. I first heard about you from Avery Yale Camilla, who is a writer. Yeah, I interviewed her on the podcast a few, I don't know, a couple months ago. And um, I'm glad to know that. I'll have to thank her. Yeah, she's marvelous. And she talked about her research and she said, well, you know, there's a vegan museum. So <laughs> listeners, that's who we've got today. We've got uh, we've got Kay Stepkin, who's the founder of the Vegan Museum in Chicago. And we're going to find out a lot today, I think. <laughs> so where shall we start? How did you become you're from Chicago originally, Kay? I am. And you didn't grow up vegan, I'm guessing. That's a good guess. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that. Au contraire. <laughs> like most of us. Yes. Tell us about that. Tell us about your your vegan journey for want of a better a better. Okay. Uh, I graduated from college, University of Illinois, and went out to Berkeley for a couple of years. And one day my, uh, I was home at night, my roommate was out, I had nothing to do. And I started browsing through her books. Um, And I came across a James Bond book, Thunderball. And about maybe page eight or nine, um, M, his boss, had a very serious talk with James, who was run down and not sleeping well and not eating well and was always tired and insisted that he go to a health farm and uh, which turned out to be vegetarian as I recall Um, this was like in 1965 so it was a while ago Um, and uh, for some unknown reason this just fascinated me Um, uh, not of course James got into other adventures and not too much more about health was in there and had this been on page 90 instead of page eight or nine I might not be a vegan today. 
uh, because I didn't like the book that much. But just this one aspect of it just fascinated me. I went to the library the next day, came home with an armload of books. Now, I thought I knew all about health uh, because my mother, one of my mother's mantras was, your health is the most important thing. Um, and what that meant in my family was that if any if anything hurts, or isn't uh, if anything hurts you or doesn't feel right, you go to the doctor and you do whatever he says, and that's how you stay healthy. And so I thought I knew all about health. And um, so I came home the next day, I had an armload of books, uh, started going through them. Um, most of them I didn't relate to, but there was one book by Adele Davis that I found fascinating. She was not and never was a vegetarian. Uh, but she talked about whole grains, about eating organic, and she was a wonderful writer, gave very good reasons for it. And um, I started sort of following Adele Davis. Um, I was e eating organic. I, oh, she also had me eating liver for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. Mm -hmm. She was big on, on liver. Um, uh, but at the same time, I kept reading other things. And... I read something uh, about our environmental problems way back then. Uh, I remember reading Silent Spring. I read something about the horrible conditions of animals uh, in our factory farms. Um, and sort of without even my conscious awareness, I started piling on knowledge. And one day, so I was, I was cooking brown rice instead of white rice. I learned how to make my own bread from Adele Davis's cookbook. And one day I realized, gosh, I haven't eaten meat for over a week. That's it. I'm not eating it anymore. That was in 1970. Didn't, did not know another vegetarian. I was, I was going to all the health food stores in Chicago. None of them were vegetarian. Um, but I, it wasn't just that I wanted to get healthier. I was like so full of passion for all the damage we were doing to our planet, to ourselves, to the other animals. And within a year, I opened the bread shop. I knew I had to do something. And within a year, I opened the bread shop, which uh, until shortly before starting the museum, I thought was Chicago's first vegetarian business. Oh, and you found out something different <laughs> with your I research? I found out something different. And by the way, uh, so it took me five years to become a vegetarian after starting to eat healthy. It took me another 40 years to become a vegan. <laughs> mm. Well, I don't think that's unusual, but isn't that so interesting how, uh, as you say, if it happened on page 90 instead of page nine, the penny might not have dropped the first, that's the right. first thing, because it is, I, I often say that uh, veganism, vegetarianism, it's a practice. It's not a one and done. It's something you keep coming back to. You have to, and, and the way you practice it when you're, brand new when you start will be different most likely than years down the line plus there is such depth to it yeah there's just it's endless what we uh, can learn and what we must learn hmm. so what was the first uh chicago a vegetarian business uh oh that is a wonderful question uh hold on let me okay. Sure. Get something. I can tell you uh, the first vegetarian restaurant, okay, uh, which was the Pure Food Lunchroom, right in the middle of our downtown loop. Pure Food, P U R E. Pure Food Pure Lunchroom. Food lunchroom. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Um, uh, but the very first business, I, I don't know if that was the very first business, that, but that was the first restaurant mm -hmm. because we also had back in the 1800s we had some uh, boarding houses that were vegetarian. Uh, we had a football team that was vegetarian in the 1800s <laughs> due, wow. to the, due to the um, coach of the football team having uh, been to Kellogg's Spa, the San, the sanatorium or sanitarium in Michigan. So hence, we need a museum to collect all this fascinating Chicago information. And the way I saw it the strongest is that we need a museum because if I didn't know we had a history, neither does most anyone else. Because I've been doing this for so long. I am so enthusiastic about it, uh, spend so much time with it. And if I didn't know about our history, no one else does either. And just knowing that you have a history, I believe, makes will make us stronger. Just knowing that. Um, because if you think you have no history, any goofy idea that, which is what happened to me in the beginning, any goofy idea that comes into your mind 
um, you're going to spend time and energy on uh, because you don't know that you have people who have been doing this who you can go to for advice. You, you, you don't know that there were mistakes made in the past that you can learn from. So just knowing we have a history, I believe, will make us stronger. Well, I think this. I think that's a, a fascinating point. The idea that history does give you some parameters and some some kind of philosophical and some actual uh, some economic in, information. You know, Chicago obviously for most Americans is synonymous in the older days with uh, Upton Sinclair, uh, the jungle. Right, that was yes. the, the title of it. So it was yes. uh, the slaughterhouse capital of of the United States or yes. among among yes. those. Yes. And so we have Chicago is synonymous with meat, meat production, feeding America yes. meat. And yeah. so he, really, he, he mainly wrote to um, to tell what was really going on in the in, in our stockyards and the horrible conditions of the workers. But what he succeeded in doing even more is is strengthening vegetarianism, which was interesting. I, although I've read that that wasn't his goal. Just coincidentally. My business, the bread shop, opened the very year that the stockyards closed, 1971. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah, just that just is a coincidence, though. <laughs> 1971. So you know, I, I I briefly mentioned to you ahead of time. I spent a, a short amount of time. My first first second third grade, I was in Chicago uh, in the 1960s um, at the University of Chicago Lab School. And the, the first vegetarian I ever heard of, the first time I ever heard of vegetarianism was I went to school with Dick Gregory's daughter. Ah. And Dick Gregory what he ran did a lot for, for us. Did, yeah, did a lot in, in Chicago. He was a civil mm -hmm. rights activist. He was yes. a comedian and a performer um, and a very serious and also very funny man. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a vegetarian, I think a very, I, yes. I don't know if he was vegan at that time, but he was a very serious vegetarian yes. and, for, and for social justice sorts yes. of reasons, not just health, I think partially health, but, and so yeah. when I think of Chicago, that's my first ever recollection of a uh, of vegetarianism. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, so tell me, so you had the bread shop that was a restaurant originally, or was, was originally, it a, it was a whole grain bakery, mm -hmm. but within a month, we were also selling food to, to go in the beginning. Um, I opened the restaurant four years later across the street called bread shop kitchen. And then back as storefronts were opening up around me and then back uh, a year later, I opened a bulk food store a bulk and packaged food store adjacent to the bread shop bakery. So I had the three different businesses going. Not something I would recommend. <laughs> from a from a business standpoint. <laughs> Go do one thing and do it well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I hear you. So so how long did the uh, bread shop kitchen, how long did those businesses go on for you? The bread shop itself uh, was here for 25 years. Um they got quite successful, in my opinion. You know, it was very successful. Um, that's the store and the bakery. The restaurant I consider still open uh, because uh, two of my former employees opened it uh, under a different name. I see. So they, they bought it from you or they just continued it on in a different Almost way? Almost bought it from me, but uh -huh. wound up opening it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see. I see. So people still go to the original. What's it called now? It's called the uh, Chicago Diner. Chicago Diner. OK, so people can, in the visiting Chicago can look for the Chicago Diner and have that little that little um, connection with the past history. linked to yeah. history. <laughs> so now how does that make you a founder of the Vegan Museum? The, the first so, and only vegan museum in the world, as far as we know, as correct? As far as I know. And, and I do hear from people from other countries. Yeah, and for sure it's the only one in this country. Um, so eight or nine years ago, I was asked to talk about um, uh, Chicago's, uh, Chicago's vegetarian history um, in a radio show uh, live from the Heartland. And I went on, I, and, and, and me and the host thinking that I had opened, that I had started Chicago's Vegetarian History. So I go there, it was a nice show. Afterwards, I got a few um, uh, emails asking me to speak at other organizations in Chicago. 
Well, when I closed the bread shop, I didn't have a computer yet. So now I was computer literate and I thought, oh, I'm going to go online. Maybe there's one or two tidbits of information I don't know. So I went online, looked up Chicago's vegetarian history and was really gobsmacked, thunderstruck <laughs> to find out that not only did we have a history going back to the 1800s, but by the late 1800s, with the with the uh, World's Fair being held in Chicago, the Columbian Exposition, the center of vegetarianism in our country moved from the East Coast to Chicago. It started in the East Coast because that's where the immigrants uh, from England landed. Many of them stayed there, uh, the vegetarian immigrants from England. And so that was our center until the world's ex the exposition, which had a big um, vegetarian display that was put together by Europeans and brought here. And with that, and they brought in speakers. And um, uh, at any rate, uh, that's how I found out that we had this history that I didn't know about. And it was just... It just stunned me. And I, I think almost immediately I said to myself, we need a museum. <laughs> and of course, Chicago is a museum town. We have all the talent you could possibly want um, uh, from fabricators, uh, consultants, um, designers. We, we have all you could possibly want to put together a museum in Chicago. And... And Chicago being in the middle of the country, everybody can come see us uh, on your way to somewhere else uh, or just, you know, passing through. So right at the moment, um, the Vegan Museum is, uh, it's a traveling museum, correct? Is, is that how, yes, how it would is. we say it? So you, you uh, partner with different locations in the Chicago area so yes. that different parts of Chicago get access uh, right to to your to your exactly exhibits. and and i and i love that because of course chicago is a very diverse city and i love that we go to every neighborhood in chicago it's it's i find that very interesting and so right now you're at the harold washington uh what how, how do we refer to that, the that washington building library library which, which is the central library in chicago it's gorgeous it's huge um and uh, and we're going to be there for two months. Two months. Oh, so is that yeah. typically how long you stay at your different uh, locations? Well, prior to COVID, we would stay everywhere for one month. And then with COVID, we came to not a standstill, but we slowed down so much. Uh, we were in several Seventh-day Adventist churches um, during COVID. Um, and we stayed there for like four months, five months. Uh, and just just now, uh, this is our second library since COVID is starting to slow down. And um, the first one we were at for four months, actually, and, and now here for two. So it takes so much energy um, and so much time to do all this traveling, to, to find the places to go to, to connect with the right people. And COVID has not made anything easier. Um, I find that um, most of the libraries... Um, it seems like they have uh, maybe some new staff and um, it, it, it just seems like everything is a little more difficult. I don't know if it's for me or from others. It sounds but... like a lot of work. I mean, if you've ever moved anything, <laughs> it sounds like a lot of well, work. Chicago being what it is, I have the most wonderful moving company <laughs> and uh, and they do that work and they just do a great job with it. That's marvelous. Okay, so yeah. tell me, so give me a sense of what that means. What it what moves when you change locations with the vegan museum? What moves? What if what goes in the exhibits? The, the exhibit consists of 12 panels, each about three feet wide by seven feet tall. They hinge together so that we can arrange them all 12 um, angled from each other, or we can have three groups of four. Um, it also has a um, a video done by Victoria Moran, who's a wonderful speaker and and an author, and she gives a six or seven minute talk on uh, vegetarian history. So that is basically the museum or the exhibit. <laughs> 
And do you create uh, events around that? Do people come and speak? Are yes. there openings? Yes, every month we have a, a wonderful event. Um, coming up, Robert Grillo, who has an organization called Free From Harm in Chicago. Uh, he's a wonderful speaker, and he's going to be talking about the relationship between the food and the animals and uh, social change movements and veganism. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so, so we've had, we have speakers, we have had, uh, food demonstrations where it's allowed. Uh, we almost always have vegan snacks. Occasionally it's not allowed. Um, we've had several children's, uh, show, uh, the children's book readings. We've had some, uh, documentaries. So, so it, these things change. So the, the traveling exhibit is roughly the same, but you have different events that go in tandem with it, depending on where you're yes. located. Now, yes, would you, do. would you love a permanent location? I would love it so much. And <laughs> it, it's, it's, um, it's really through COVID that I've saw this. So for the first three years, we just kept, uh, uh, getting stronger and stronger, more and more people were coming to our events. And then that sudden halt, um, and now, as I said, I, I really don't know if it's the world or me or everything, <laughs> but it's just, uh, it's just seems to take a lot of energy, um, to be moving all the time in terms of, in terms of finding the places to move to and, and the people to talk to. Um, yes, I would love to be in a permanent spot now, um, either a very, very large storefront in, in a very busy neighborhood, like five, 6,000 square feet, or a, our own space in a community organization uh, or, or another museum. Mm. And so we are just starting to explore that now. Yeah, I would love to see that. With that, uh, there is so much more we could do. Um, so here we have our exhibit. Um, we could be having exhibits from other st strong vegan organizations around the country. Um, our board could work with, with their board and we'd build the exhibit here in Chicago, but they would give us all the information for it and we'd go back and forth. That would be wonderful. Or uh, so they could have their a whole exhibit of four panels possibly, or they could have one panel, you know, and several could be attached together. Um, we could bring in speakers from around the country. Uh, we've done it only twice, uh, but it, we could be doing that more on a regular basis. Um, we could have, uh, we could have uh, food classes. It would all just depend on, on the space that we have. Mm. Um, but yes, it is time for a permanent space. So if anyone's listening that has a four or 5,000 square foot storefront in Chicago or has uh, access to some other um, permanent solution for uh, for the Vegan Museum, it would be great if they, they piped up, right? <laughs> oh, that would be so wonderful. I always thought um, that one day someone would come to one of our events and say, oh, let's do this or let's do that or get a bigger space. Um, but it didn't just happen. I guess it will. you have to make it happen. <laughs> I'm sure it will. Well, you know, the thing is that that's what, that's the one good thing about um, everybody being on computers is that you can reach people and you can get to people so much more easily. I think that's, uh -huh, that's, that a, that's true. a benefit. So that's, but that's fascinating. And the idea, you know, I, I a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking to someone who started a veg fest and I was like, you can just start a veg fest. And Where now I'm talking uh, in Rhode Island, in Providence, uh -huh. Rhode Island. And so and I was thinking you can just start a museum. <laughs> That's marvelous. <laughs> but you can. Not too many people knew less about starting a museum than I than I did. <laughs> but if you're living in Chicago, you can. <laughs> so you just said you um you didn't know very much about building a museum on your yeah. on your own. <laughs> what got you through all the different decision making you had to do? Like where did you start? What was the first thing you did? The first thing I did actually was decide uh, to have a storefront because I know, because I've had storefronts. And so that's something I'm familiar with. And I, I visited many storefronts. And uh, in fact, I remember starting interviews with somebody to be the manager of the storefront, um, although we didn't have the funding to do it. I don't know what I was thinking, but um, 
One day, I happen to be a librarian and love libraries. And one day I just walked into a neighborhood library and there was an exhibit uh, from writers, I think famous Chicago writers. And I think they now have their own museum space on Michigan Avenue. Um, and I saw that, I thought, oh, how perfect. This would be uh, this would be a good place to start because it's so much simpler to have an exhibit and move it to different libraries. Okay, that that I love that because this that's a great example. A lot, I, a lot of my clients c- come to me. They're like, "I'd like to do that, but how would I? How how would it happen? Whatever, whatever their topic is, and that's exactly is you have the idea, and then you keep your eyes open, right? Absolutely, because that doesn't come yeah. to you until you've got that, the that idea thought in your combined head. with the enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So I love, I I think that's just such a great example to people. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You might not know. You might not know how to solve your problem yet, but you just think about it and you keep going out and, and interacting with the world on it. Yes. So you said that. So you were out there, you saw it and you had, you were like, that would be a solution for the first step. Yes. Mm. I then went online. I looked up um, museum. I don't know what verb I used, museum creators. I inter- I like to, I like to do things in threes. I said, okay, I'm going to interview three people, and um, one of them I liked very much, and uh, through him, then got to a company that does fabrication. Through the head of that company, got to my consultant, who I still work with. She's quite wonderful, Bethany Fleming Consultants. Um, and now, you know, one thing would take me to another. So do you have a, do you have a outreach for, um, what, what am I trying to say? Uh, what is it called when you, when you, you solicit funds, fundraising? <laughs> oh, I have had very bad luck with it. Um, right in the beginning, I, I thought this has got to be very important. And I, I had two or maybe three fundraisers who got us zero grants. Okay. Um, I then had a very expensive, um, he called himself a an advancement person. He mm-hmm. advances organizations. I worked with, and he was very smart and great to talk to. Uh, I worked with him for nine months. He brought us in $150. Oh. Um But in the meanwhile, through all of that, um, there was a fundraising organization that I knew of through um, a uh, vegan summer fest, which is uh, a fest I go to every summer. They're starting up again this this July. Uh, So I I got uh, I would get two grants a year from them. And so little things here and there. And I have never advanced past the little things here and there. Mm. Okay. So that's, that's probably the, the long range plan. No. Yes. Yes. Your strategic plan. So when, um, when people visit, do you have a lot of people who just wander in individually or is it, do you have like, like a lot of school groups that come in or community groups, boy scouting, et cetera, do they come through or is it both? Uh, we don't have that much. The most people come at once to our events. So we've had up to 200 people coming to events prior to COVID. Now I want to say we're up to 60 since Mm -hmm. COVID. Um, But we, we, yeah, we have not had that much, but that is certainly something that could happen. And is there an online component? Do you have a Zoom meeting? Yes, we have a website. We put out weekly on Facebook, um, on Instagram, uh, What's the third one? I'm not too good with that, but there's somebody that does that for us. I got good. you. I got you. No, that's it. That, because you're the founder. You're the visionary. I'm not, I, you're not the, uh, you're, yeah. So as the visionary, what do you want us to know? What I would like people to know is that it is my beliefs. It is my strong belief. And it's what motivates me uh, is that, all the all the problems we're having, we're in the middle of some huge health crises. We our environment is uh, falling apart. Uh, we don't really know how this COVID's going to end or what's going to happen. I uh, I, th- I think that our I think that we're in the middle of the sixth great extinction on the planet. That phrase was not created by me, but there have been several books written about it. 
Uh, it's the first one that's happened since our species has been here. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it seems to be something that happens every few million years on the planet, and it's happening right now. So I don't think we're going to get back to where we were. And I think for us to save our planet, that it is quite uh, uh, important, necessary. Uh, I, I think I think veganism is a very important component of saving it. It's not the only thing, but it's a, an important component as it also covers health, the environment, all the other species. So I think I think knowing the big picture of where life is headed on our planet is very important. This is not just about our individual health. Uh, it is about our entire species and perhaps even all life surviving. Yeah. So it's it's serious. Yeah, but but it goes even beyond that. Like things are in such bad shape right now that it's not just a question of all of us starting to eat whole grain or to stop eating meat. We have to le learn to work together more harmoniously. So I think the most important thing we could be doing is for each person to be developing his or her character. And um, uh, we need to become people who can be trusted, who can be counted on, who, who can work harmoniously with other people. We are social creatures. And um, there's a certain way that, that we have to be in order to work together and to want to work together. So I think that's going to be behind our survival on the planet, more important than how we eat even or, or the start of it. So your creation of the vegan museum, your founding of it, it's, it's, you're, you're demonstrating what one individual who is, wants to share their information, wants to share their concerns with their community. So I, I think that you, you are yourself de demonstrating that kind of character. You're challenging everybody else to, um, to show up as to come bring bring us your best ideas bring us your your history bring us what you know that could make a difference yes <laughs> yeah yeah so what what so when people come to visit the vegan museum uh what kind of what kind of uh, feedback do you get from them what kind of responses do you get i'm guessing most of them aren't vegan um, I would go to 50, 50. Really? Okay. Yeah. And, and actually that's pretty much who we're trying to reach. Um, uh, people who are, you know, enthusiastic, diehard vegans, of course I want to see them, but to me, the most important group we can reach are people sort of on the brink. There are people, and I count every single member of my family among them, <laughs> There are people, no matter what you say, no matter what information you give them, <clears throat> they are not going to change. That's it. They're meat eaters. Um, and, and like I said, then there are the people who are enthusiastic vegans. What, who we really want to reach are those people on the brink and just bring them over. Um, because for each one of them we get, they can bring over another dozen. And this is what we need. Like things are changing faster now. Our, our environment has been self-destruct. Our environment has been destructing for years now, decades now. Uh, but it's picked up speed lately. Mm. It's going faster and faster, and we need to change faster and faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now the history of of veganism that you you in, include. Um, why do you think? Why do you think, uh, what do you think we can learn from the fact that there was a significant vegan history that most of us don't know anything about? Yes. Well, I have a theory on it, which I haven't read anywhere. So I, you know, and I don't know if this is true, but my theory is, well, first of all, this is a fact that our movement was really big in the late 1800s up until the early 1900s. Uh, by maybe the 30s or the 40s, it came, no, 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 no. By the, earlier than that, by the 20s, it had come to a standstill. With the depression, the probably, probably with the depression. World War yeah. One, the depression, mm -hmm. World War Two, yeah. And, and when did it start up again? In the late 60s, when our country at least was getting prosperous again. Well, what's, what's our situation now? 
We could be on the brink of another world war so easily. It's all that's going on. Um, our movement could come to a standstill again. So what, his, what the history of our movement is te teaches us is get with it. If you, if you are tending toward vegetarianism or veganism right now, do it now. If, if you want to talk to your friends about it, um, but maybe you're a little hesitant, you don't want them to think you're weird, talk to them about it. Do whatever you can to strengthen us mm. because we could be on the verge of another world war. We don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it still matters, even if there's so I think that I think that's uh, an interesting um correlation to make it's with our political stability and our economic prosperity that there are uh intersections with alternative ideas and veganism and opting out of certain kinds of industries which i think most of the people who listen to me are that's kind of their main mm, interest is to not support industries which are cruel which are dangerous for the workers which are involved with deforestation and water use and greenhouse gas. Um, so th that's an area where I feel like more and more and more people are uh, vested. In businesses, in improving businesses. In opting out of certain businesses and trying to support alternative uh -huh. ones. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, and the, um, uh, I'm I'm trying to remember what we were we were going to just double check. Oh, Victoria Moran, tell me about Victoria Moran. Okay, <laughs> what she's is quite she? Wonderful. Is... She's a great speaker. Yeah, very enthusiastic. She lived in the Chicago area for a while. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, maybe in her twenties. Um, where did I meet Victoria? A Probably... lot of people know her as the Main Street Vegan, and she does. Uh, she creates yes. vegan coaching materials, and yes, and she does coaching, uh, not just classes, but like over a period of a week or two weeks, does a a, a class maybe mm -hmm. at her home in New York. Yeah, uh, and so yeah. she and she did the video for, and your... she did the video for us. We sent somebody to New York. Uh, to her house to interview her. And then we uh, edited it back here in Chicago. And she's another one who's been vegan a long time, like yourself. Yes, she has. Yeah, yes, she has. Yeah. yeah, we're a lot of us are Johnny come lately to this. Uh, <laughs> but I think that that's good. I think I, I that's one of the things I want to make sure people realize is there's no it's not too late. It's not you can always start making these decisions and start leaning into this kind of a lifestyle and learning more about the history. Never of it too because, late and influencing yeah. others. Never yeah. too late. Yeah. So um, your vegan story is so fascinating. It starts with a James Bond novel on a, on a friend's. <laughs> so <laughs> I wonder, I wonder what everybody else's will be. I'd love, I'd love to hear. That's why I do so many um, interviews. I love to we hear have on our website. We have, we have a board of directors. Um, I'm sorry. We, we have a, uh, an advisory council. Okay. And we interview them on our website. And I, I, I believe the main, um, and I believe the main question, Elizabeth Alfano was the interviewer, and uh, she's a media person also. And I believe her main question to them was, how did you get into veganism? So there, there's some interesting people to hear. And so see. everybody could go on to veg, uh, let's see, it's vegmuse.org, right? Yes, or veganmuseum.org. Or veganmuseum.org. You can go on it through a few different names. And you can get a lot of the background of the museum, a lot yes, of a lot of resources available. Yes, yeah, some interviews I've done. We'll probably put this one on. Great. Uh, yeah, and uh, some interviews I've done, and the interviews with our advisory council, and yeah, yeah, there's some interesting things on there. <laughs> So if there's somebody who wants to, um, in their community, maybe they don't want to step up into your into your shoes of a vegan museum, but in their community, they want to somehow make more of an impact and be a little bit more um, activist in 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 a way of information and welcoming people to this area uh, of life. What would you suggest to them? How would you oh, that's a encourage great question. them? I hadn't thought it through, you know, for others, but uh, you could start a meetup. 
in your area, have a vegan dinner once a month or, or do it once, do it once. You don't even need the commitment at first and then go to once a month or, you know, you do it more slowly. Um, you could have a, an event in possibly in your neighborhood library and then possibly do that once a month. Um, you could gather a few friends together to go to one of the vegan festivals that are around the country. Uh, that would be interesting. Those are all great ideas. <laughs> no, those are all great ideas. I think that's all terrific. Um, I'm going to respect your time because we've uh, we're, we're pushing up onto an hour, and I know you've got you've got uh, funds to raise and people to get aware <laughs> and locations to scout. I'm assuming. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I think it's just marvelous of you to make time for us. We're going to uh, share this as much as we can. And hopefully someone listening wants to help, uh, help with your fundraising, help with uh, location scouting ideas that they might have and partnerships that might be available. Is there anything else you're specifically looking for at the Vegan Museum right now? I think, no, what you just named are a couple of most important paths. That's great. That's great. So we're going to we're going to beat the bushes and hopefully hopefully a little bit more will uh, will will come in your direction, because do you know where you're going after the Harold Washington uh, Library uh, or is that not discussed yet? Uh, it's in the middle of discussions, in but it hasn't been finalized. OK, OK, because I think this um, this episode will probably air in early March. So in early March, uh, maybe you can go on veganmuseum.org or yes. veg or vegmuse.org. You can go there to see what the upcoming events and schedule and uh, locations are going to be. Yes. Thank you so much, Kay. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. So, so what did you think? What did you think of Kay Stepkin? You know, if 007 can start someone moving towards a vegan lifestyle, just think how many opportunities for change are all around us all the time. What I loved most about talking with Kay is that throughout her story, I never heard her say things like, maybe this is impossible. What if it doesn't work? No, she just kept making it work. She just kept making it work one decision at a time. And I know I, know I mentioned in the interview that I learned about Kay and the Vegan Museum from previous guest, journalist and vegetarian historian Avery Yale Camilla, and I wanted to mention that that is episode 112, Avery Yale Camilla. And if you're interested in learning more about the Vegan Museum, or even better, helping it a little bit in its mission, it has a super simple website, veganmuseum.org. Veganmuseum.org. So whenever you're listening to this episode, in the future, this week, Two years from now, you'll be able to find all the events, the speakers, the location, and ways to support the Vegan Museum at veganmuseum.org. You know, it's actually been my honor to donate to the Vegan Museum, and I hope, I'm hoping that others of you will see fit to consider it in any amount, or if you'd like to help with fundraising or grant writing or outreach, please yourself reach out to Kay. I'll have her email in the show notes. So get out there and do something this week, even if it seems a little bit impossible, even if it seems a lot impossible. You know, it's not so much the goal that you're reaching for that could be amazing. It's who you actually have to become when you're stepping forward to begin. That's what gives me so much so much excitement in this space and so much connection in my life. And I really want that for each of you. Okay, kids, I'll see you next week. And until then, please veg your best. Veg Your Best podcast production, music, and editing by Charlie Weinshank. Thanks, Charlie. Before you go, it would mean so much to me and the Veg Your Best team if you would hit subscribe, leave us a five-star review, or share with someone you think might be interested. Something about algorithms, it helps bump us up a little in the rankings, 
And that's the best way to help others find the podcast and for us to find our audience. So until next week, make it easy and veg your best. <laughs>